Hey everybody, just going to do a quick lecture on oxygen delivery devices. I was just going to start at like the lowest flow and kind of work my way up to uh, the more mechanical stuff all the way up to the most severe form of oxygen delivery we have, which is ECMO. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. So what do we give oxygen for? Um, you know, as people, obviously they can't get enough on their own. So... Um, whatever condition they have, whether it be COPD, asthma, pneumonia, um, just underdeveloped lungs, cystic fibrosis, heart failure, you know, the pulmonary edema, any sort of lung disease like cancer, trauma, surgery, um, post extubation, we always give them oxygen with humidity. Um, trach patients get humidified oxygen, and sometimes you kind of just give them a little bit of extra oxygen while they're dealing with heavy secretions. Um, just multitude of reasons why. So we use, you know, just simple things, nasal cannulas, venturi masks, simple masks, a lot of masks, um, you know, high flow cannulas as well, non rebreathers, BiPAPs, ventilators, oscillators, and, uh, you know, ECMO for our extreme cases. So nasal cannulas, they go all the way from 0.25 liters per minute for our neonatal patients up to 6 liters per minute. And then there's a general rule of thumb, you know, 4 or liters um, require uh, some humidity, usually a bubbler, um, or if the patient complains of dry nares, it's not hard to set up. We do it all the time. Um, for the neonates, infants, and pediatric patients, you always give them humidity. And, you know, sometimes you give it for the therapeutic purposes of them, you know, being in the hospital, dealing with some sort of pulmonary issue, or as a means of constant care, like um, patients that have COPD and they need it as part of their daily living. And the FiO2 you're going to get is roughly anywhere from 24 to 40%. It just depends on um, how fast you're breathing, how deep your breaths are. And it's just the amount of oxygen that's in training with the room air can change constantly. So um, that's why it's always a rough estimate. Uh, venturi masks using the Venturi method uh, can deliver a more of a precise amount of oxygen at a higher flow. Um, you know, there's certain ratios depending on the flow and the oxygen percentage you're wishing to acquire. Um, the ratio really isn't important, um, unless you're a respiratory therapy student listening to this, then your ratios are very important and you're going to test it on your boards on it. So keep that in mind. But for the rest of us, um, you know, for example, if you want to give a patient, you know, 40% FiO2, um, the venturi mask you have in front of you is very similar to the one that I use in the hospital I work at, and it requires 12 liters of flow. And the, you know, the ratio is one to three. So you add that together, that's four times 12, that's 48 total liters of flow per minute for this patient. Um, and, you know, we give these to people that are just requiring a high level, higher level of flow. Um, for whatever reason and you know we also use that as a weaning method from like a non rebreather down so that we hopefully we can get them down to a nasal cannula at some point and there's even some patients that do have something that's called air hunger you know are they they're not starving for oxygen but it's just they need to feel that air blowing in their face and that's where the the patients that require higher levels of inspiratory flow come in and then simple masks are just that a simple mask uh, five to ten liters of flow um, nothing too crazy that I can say that you're going to experience with those. Most of the time you're just going to see them, um, on paramedic, uh, usage, or I see them fairly often for patients that are being, uh, moved from the OR post extubation to the PACU. And usually for these people, you want to give them that higher level of flow uh, just as a means to wash out the carbon dioxide that they exhale. And for these patients, you're going to get roughly about 40 to 60%, depending on how they breathe. Um, then we also use aerosolized oxygen uh, using the same Venturi setup. Um, and we, you know, we give that for a multitude of reasons as well. You know, same thing with neonates, peds. Um, most trach patients, you're going to give it to them as a way to humidify the air they breathe because the trachea bypasses the nose and the mouth, the natural method of... Uh, humidifying the air we breathe so um, and also for patients that we extubate um, just given that cool mist helps with the inflammation of the airway and uh, hopefully you know reduces the risk of the patient developing strider 
Um, and then there's some cases like epiglottitis with children that require you to give them aerosolized um, cool mist oxygen, and hopefully it, it doesn't you know cause their uh, condition to get worse. And um, trachs, if their tr open trach does not have any humidity running, they can potentially plug off. The air you breathe in in a hospital is really dry most of the time. So unless they have like a passy mirror on or their trach is capped, um, it's always good to have a little bit of humidity uh, running. You don't necessarily have to use oxygen. So I've seen patients on room air um, getting hooked up to the you know, the flow meter that they just need the humidity. So um, that's always a possibility as well. And, you know, air slides oxygen works with patients who are having a uh, heavy secretion and it can help uh, in conjunction with like a muca mist or 3% saline uh, to get them to cough and clear that stuff up. And for this, you know, using the Venturi setup that it is, you can vary the FiO2 if you need to. Uh, partial and non rebreathers uh, these are the highest concentration of oxygen of any uh, low flow device um, you know 70 90 percent 90 to 100 percent you always want to make sure your bag is filling up with air um, and if the patient can't hold their sets on you know these 15 liters of flow uh, the next step is either going to be BiPAP CPAP or mechanical ventilation and then we also have high flow nasal cannulas. They're set up similarly to a um, aerosolized, um, like a Venturi setup. Almost they have a blender on there. They can deliver up to uh, 60 liters, and they also have a blender that can titrate the oxygen um, to, according to the blender we have, it's about 31, 32 percent, all the way up to 100. Um, for people that don't want to wear a mask. Um, you can actually um, put them on a high flow and usually they're a little bit more comfortable with it um, and due to the higher flows it can dry them out so that's why we heat and humidify the air and it keeps people from going into like a hypoxic respiratory failure it helps with uh, mucus plugging for some of our trach patients and the higher flows actually have a small CPAP effect for these people as well. Uh, BiPAP and CPAP you know BiPAP um, outside of the hospital is used mostly for the patient to have sleep apnea. Um, we also use it inside the hospital to help with sleep apnea. Um, COPD patients, myasthenia gravis, yeah, brazier pneumonias, um, just to name a few. And, you know, you can vary the pressures with BiPAP to work with uh, your ventilation issues. And then you can also use the lower end pressures of the CPAP to work with oxygenation and for the most part, it's a precursor to mechanical ventilation if you don't improve uh, using this method. And they both can be heated and humidified if you need them to be, um, but not always. Usually in the shorter term, you don't need to. And then we have the mechanical ventilator. Um, it's, you know, we use time, pressure, flow, and oxygen to help maintain oxygenation and ventilation and also help correct acid-base balances in the body while it heals from whatever condition that it needs to be healed from. And most of the time, the only, you know, there's only three reasons why you're ever going to be intubated is to protect your airway, your inability to oxygen, your inability to ventilate. If you do want to take a look at my ventilator uh, lecture, um, I go into a lot more detail and there's actually a couple of slides of reasons of why you'll ever be intubated. Um, but it's for the sake of this presentation, it's just a little too long to uh, list out. And then we have the oscillator, um, high frequency ventilator is the other name for it. And it was actually um, developed to mimic the panting of a dog. Um, I don't know how that happened, but you know, it is what it is. And whoever invented it, it works great. Um, and it's it was meant to help initially with patients who had ARDS to reduce the possibility of like a ventilator associated lung injury uh, when lung protective ventilation became um, the new standard for um, ventilator management um, they wanted something that operated at a lower mean airway pressure so this was invented and you know the other ventilators were obviously honed better but you know this one gives a smaller tidal volume 
at a higher frequency, usually around 150 or so. Um, you heat and humidify this and that little piston over there on the machine on the right, and it works kind of like a speaker with bass. You know, it, it just it vibrates. Um, the only time I've ever seen these used is in a NICU. Um, you can use them on adults. They're just not used as often. Um, but I never did NICU and PICU, so I can't say what the current um, trend is with oscillators. Um, I can tell you at my facility we don't use them. There's been discussion, but um, no one has, no one's bought one. And then for the most extreme cases, we have ECMO, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, and it works pretty similar to how a perfusion machine works for open heart surgeries. Um, the most common thing that I've seen it used for is, you know, congenital diaphragmatic hernias for NICU patients, um, just overall congenital defects of the heart. Um, I've seen it with also meconium aspiration, although the way they treat meconium aspiration anymore that's not used nearly as much I see more in severe cases it is um, I've seen uh, severe influenzas patients go on ECMO uh, when uh, rotoproning doesn't work um, it just depends on the patient's overall needs but I can tell you right now that if you are really sick and nothing else is working for you um, ECMO is probably going to be the last line of defense to oxygenate your tissues while your body heals. So um, keep that in mind if you ever uh, see a person on it. And just you, you can't just willy-nilly do it. There's a training program. There's proctoring that goes with it. So it's a specialization. And uh, for the people that do do that, my hat goes off to you. Um, and, uh, if there's any questions, um, you can email me at mediocrert at gmail.com. As always, feedback is welcome. Um, if you like my stuff, subscribe. I'm always looking to release new content. So, uh, thank you very much and enjoy your day.